I am anticipating that the moment this video is uploaded, there will appear for me some hate mail typed in capital letters from somebody who is not prepared to understand. What we are interested in, in in this channel is the grammatical forms of words and grammatical forms of phrases in the writings of the prophets and apostles, so reproduced organically, and then gathering the internal harmony and what God was actually wanting to tell us, as opposed to what the lukewarm word of tradition wants to tell us and deceive us about. Now, here's how it works. The lukewarm take their doctrines to the Bible, and whatever they read, they uh, interpret it as, oh, this is what it means, because they've got something in their head. And we, though, the growing remnant, take the Bible to our doctrine, and we are prepared to fall backwards if necessary and admit that we have been wrong and we just want to know the truth. So, they insult us and abuse us because we want to know the truth, and they call us names. So we're interested in what the Hebrew and Greek actually say, um, not what they say when they've been doctored and butchered by men of the flesh. Well, hello and very warm greetings as ever. My name is Christopher Sparks and I'm the translator of the Keys of the Kingdom Holy Bible and here is the hardback edition without its dust jacket in its hardback um, beautiful gold and red that the publisher produced for us. And now Jesus said against them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, In hearing you will hear, yet in no way will you understand. And in seeing you will see, yet in no way will you perceive. For the heart of this people has grown callous, and with the ears they hardly hear. And they have closed their eyes, in case at any time they should see with the eyes with the eyes, and they should hear with the ears, and should understand with the heart, and they would turn, and I would heal them. So, do the scriptures say God is three, or do the scriptures say God is one? Well, the prophets and apostles and Jesus say God is one, but the church fathers and their successors have told us God is three. And one of them I read said, God is three in one and one in three. Well, God is one, the scriptures say, and Jesus ten times referred to his Father as my God. God is God, and Jesus, like us, had a God he served and worshipped. How do we know he worshipped God? After he had announced the new covenant in his blood, it says in Mark 14, and when they had sung a song, that's at the Last Supper, they went out into the Mount of Olives. So together Jesus and the disciples sang a song of worship to God, to their God and their Father. Elohim whom we call God, who created the heavens and the earth, is a title of the Creator. But some want to say that that word Elohim is a plural word. But he is he, not they. And the uh, word Elohim takes singular pronouns when it refers to God, just like Yahweh does, and the numerous other titles. And we have in English words like species, innings, trout, sheep, fish, series, all words which act as both plural and singular. And Elohim is also Yahweh. So they are one and the same, and Yahweh is not a plural word. And also another title, a divine title, is Echad, which means one. And he has many other names and titles, which are shown in Appendix 1 of the Keys of the Kingdom Bible. And they are 
um, he is known in all of them as he or him. Now the prophet Moses declared the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4 Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim is one Yahweh. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu Yahweh Echad. Echad, this word means one. Now this was commanded because of the surrounding polytheism of the Canaanites. Deuteronomy 6.14 You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are around you. For Yahweh your Elohim, so there are the two terms together, is a jealous God among you. In case the anger of Yahweh your Elohim is kindled against you, and he wipes you out from the face of the land. This truth, God is one, was acknowledged um, to Jesus by a scribe. Mark 12, 32. Teacher, you have spoken in line with truth, that he is one, and there is no other beside him. Now this stands today against the dim doctrine of the so-called Trinity, by which men call on three gods and call them one, so as to deceive the sheep and perpetuate ancient Babylonian polytheistic occultic magic. Now this word Echad, its Strong's Concordance reference, H259, and Gesenius's, um Hebrew-English lexicon says, only one of its kind. Echad means one, and it's used at Job 23.13 as a title of God. Did not Echad shape us in the womb? Echad, the one, as a divine title. Ezekiel 7.5 a calamity, a singular calamity has, has surely come. That word singular, it's echad. It's the opposite of a plurality. Genesis 1.9 Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together to one place and let dry ground appear. Echad, one place. Genesis 11.1 1. The whole earth became of one lip and of one speech. Echad lip, echad speech. Leviticus 14.10 He shall take one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish. One ewe lamb, echad. Never anything else. But, you know, you could hardly believe it. At this very point where Moses is drawing his people away from worshipping the plurality, the polytheistic um, God system of the Canaanites, at this very point, God is telling us that he is one. Well, the lukewarm are telling us, no, this word echad means a unity, a plurality. You could hardly believe it. So if you look it up in Strong's Concordance at, under the reference H259, you will see every occurrence, and it never means unity. It means the exact opposite of unity. So it's like saying black is white, and it's a delusion and a lie and deception. Echad does not mean unity. It means one one of its kind, a singularity. So, you see how it works, as I said at the beginning, they take their doctrine to the Bible and make it mean what they want it to mean, and it doesn't matter. But we take the Bible to our doctrine, and it does matter. So, you see the trick. Now, an American poet called the tongue that antique bill hook and the things that that antique bill hook has been allowed to say um, I think that's a wonderful phrase All right, we're going to go through a few passages in John 1 1 for example the word word logos in Greek should not 
be capitalized because they did this um, to try and persuade us it's about Jesus in the beginning was the word that Jesus was there at the beginning this is delusion and deception it's about the spoken declaration of God to the prophets and that that spoken declaration uh, by the prophets pointed to was in the direction towards God and about God pros theos pros ton theo and it is not with God it is not meta so they've changed it it's about the declared um, word of God to his people that's what John 1 1 is about it's not about Jesus now John 1 3 reads from the Greek everything arose or has arisen through it that's how it starts everything arose or has arisen through it or has come to pass through it John is declaring in his prologue of integrity that everything he's writing about has arisen through the declared word of God that's what he's saying but these um, doctored and butchered Bibles have changed it and put all things were created through him well all things that's wrong for a start it's everything it's a singular pronoun um, all things and everything are called in grammar universal pronouns and um, so everything takes a singular verb and the verb that follows it is agenato and that is a singular verb now the the word um, is the the pronoun in the Greek is panta which can be plural but it's not here because the verb is singular so it's everything and then you're familiar th with the constant phrasing throughout the Bible and it came to pass it came to be it happened that it arose it came to pass it came to pass that's exactly what is being said here everything has come to pass through it through the Word of God there is no word in John 1 3 which means were made it's just not there now whether you know grammatical terms or not it doesn't matter you will get the point this word agenito is singular aorist um, active intransitive and uh, what's the other ones did I say stative um, singular aorist active stative intransitive but were made is plural passive imperfect transitive dynamic so they've got naught out of five for grammar and it doesn't mean were made they got uh, there's another mark for that they've got the wrong meaning so that's naught out of six and they've wrecked John's prologue so naught out of seven but of course they're trying to imply that Jesus is the creator which is rubbish so they're robbing God of his act of creation by saying that actually another was responsible for creation and not God after all they are robbing God by fiddling the grammar the King James translators fiddled the grammar they altered a legal document a divine legal document now the word um, were made if, if it were in John 1 3 would be something like ectisthesan which occurs in Revelation 4 11 all things were created right at Romans 9 5 Paul rejoices in Christ being over everything and about it he says God be praised throughout the eons and he says that elsewhere I wish I'd marked the other places that I didn't and I won't stop to find them now but you see how the King James translators fiddled this they put Christ came who is over all God blessed forever now when I was in error I used to cite this passage but of course it's been fidgeted 
Um, at Colossians 1.16, they've got again this were made, trying to make out that Christ, uh, all things were made through Christ. And it's not true. They're robbing God of his act of creation. And in Colossians 1.16, there is no verb were made. No plural, passive, imperfect verb meaning were made. But there is um, the verb is founded or is established. Everything is now founded, is established under Christ. Because all authority on heaven and earth has been given to him. It says that so many times that uh, you can't miss it. And um, the verb is ketizo, and it's aorist, passive, singular. It is not plural, passive, imperfect. So here we have another falsification. So just from those few verses, you see that the King James Bible, the, the old King Jimmy, um, would not translate back into the original languages. Now, if you wrote me a shopping list and you put on it Der's Ordinateur, um, you wanted me to come back with two computers and de tele, de telephone, two telephones and two books and I came back with a cat basket. Well, you would think, but I, yeah, I hadn't got the slightest idea what your shopping list said. Or if you wanted a bag of peas and I came back with a bottle of ink. Well, that's what you're getting. Getting a bottle of ink instead of a bag of peas. They've fixed it. And it's dishonest. And so they are adding what they want it to say and they are, ta they are taking away what it does say. And this is illegal. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. Um, when I really discovered that passage in the early 1990s, it hit me like a freight train rolling. And I was obsessed with it. And so was a friend of mine, the pair of us. We were in Toronto. This adding and taking away, and you suffer plagues for doing it. I wouldn't dare, and I don't want to. So the King James translators believed that God divided himself into three bits, as in ancient Babylonian pagan mystery occultic magic. It doesn't make sense. You can't explain it. Somebody last year, or was it early this year, I think it was January of this year, asked me, did I believe in the Trinity? And I said, no. And she said, oh, well, when my husband comes along, he'll be able to explain it to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> like, I, you know, I, ha I wasn't aware of it. Um, and then I know every passage that they've fiddled and how they've done it. I've published it in my book, The Earth-Shaking Truth. Right, so I've already quoted the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4. Let's go through some passages. Deuteronomy 4.35. Um, the Lord is God, or in Hebrew, Yahweh Ha Elohim. Yahweh Ha Elohim. The Lord is God. There is no one else beside him. No one else. Well, do you believe that? Or don't you? Take your pick. If you don't believe it and you want to make it say something else, well, then you are deluding yourself. Um, Deuteronomy 4.39 Again, Yahweh Ha Elohim. So, the Lord your God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Sorry, um, no, it doesn't read like that. The Lord um, is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath, there is no other. So you see, you cannot say that Elohim is plural and it means the plurality, because Yahweh is Elohim, the Lord is God, they're one and the same. And you cannot say that about the word Yahweh. It doesn't work, your little trick doesn't work, you lukewarm. Deuteronomy 6.4, I'll say it again. Hear, O Israel, 
Yahweh our Elohim is one Yahweh, Yahweh Echad. Isaiah 43.10 You are my witnesses, declares Yahweh, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you might know and believe me and understand that I am he. He, not they. No God was formed before me. Oh, nor will there be any after me. Ha, huh. so he is the only one. No one before him, no one after. I, yes, I am Yahweh, and apart from me there is no Saviour. I have declared, and I have saved, and I have proclaimed, and there is no foreign God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, declares Yahweh, that I am God. Isaiah 44, 6 Yahweh, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, says this, I am the first and the last. Now there's an arresting phrase, the first and the last. Now if you enter a race and you are the only entrant, you come first and you come last. Um, oh, about 10 or 12 years ago, I was asked to judge a poetry competition in a literary festival. And it was for a sonnet, to construct a sonnet. And I only received two entries, and one of them was by the director of the literary festival, and the other was by somebody else, and the one by somebody else was not even a sonnet, so I couldn't include that in my judgment, and it only left one. So there is only one um, legible um, entry for this literary festival sonnet competition. I only had to choose one, and the director came first and last in the competition because there was no one before him and no one after him who composed a sonnet. Right, and apart from me there is no God, and who can proclaim as I do? Let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the people of old and the things that are coming and will come. Let them declare these to them. Neither fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God apart from me? Indeed, no rock. I do not know any. Isaiah 45, 6. So you're getting that Isaiah is pretty obsessed with this. Um... His war against the Canaanite polytheism. So that they might know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one apart from me. I am Yahweh and there is no one else. Isaiah 45.14 They will make a request to you saying, Surely God is among you and there is no one else, no other God. So, is there another God or isn't there? Is God one or is God two and three and six and nine? Isaiah 45, 18, for Yahweh says this, Barach Shamayim, the creator of the heavens. Elohim is he who formed the earth. Elohim is he, not they. It is singular who formed the earth and made it, who fixed it firm, who did not create it a waste, he formed it to be inhabited. I am Yahweh, and there is no one else. So Yahweh is he, Yahweh is Elohim. There is not another. Isaiah 45:21. Speak and bring forward your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I, Yahweh, and no other God apart from me, a just God and Saviour? No one apart from me. Look to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no one else. 
Isaiah 46, 9. Remember the things of old, for I am God, and there is no one else. I am Elohim, and there is no one like me. Isaiah 48, 12. Listen to me, Jacob and Israel, my called people. I am he, not they, the first and the last. Zechariah 14, 9. Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yahweh will be one and his name one. So then he will be known as one and not as this polytheistic triad. You know, it will not be permitted in the coming kingdom. False teachers will be put to death according to Zechariah. Now, on to the New Testament, Matthew twenty-seven forty-six. At about the ninth hour, Jesus shouted out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God. This was spoken, or is spoken ten times by Christ in the New Testament. Here twice, Mark fifteen thirty-four twice, John twenty seventeen, Revelation three two, Revelation three twelve four times, and my God was also written by Paul. So Jesus had the same God as Paul. And does God have a God? No, Jesus is not God. Jesus had a God and called him my God. Mark ten eighteen, Jesus said to him. Why do you call me good? Nobody is good except one, God. Now this word, one, in Greek is ice. Mark 12.32 Teacher, you have spoken in line with truth, that he is one and there is no other beside him. So this one is Strong's Concordance Reference, G1520, and it's the Greek equivalent of of the Hebrew Echad. And so, for some examples of ice, Matthew 5.18, until heaven and earth pass away, um, not one iota nor one merest ornament will in any way pass fro from the law until it might all come into being. So, not one iota nor one merest ornament does that mean unity, plurality? No. Matthew 6, 27. Who among you by being anxious is able to pro prolong one forearm's length to his stature? One. Ice. Not a unity of forearm's lengths. John ten sixteen. There will be one flock with one shepherd. Ice flock, ice shepherd. Not a unity flock, a unity shepherd. James 2.19 You acknowledge that God is one. Now if that were, we were writing that in Hebrew, it would be, um, well you know it now, don't you? Elohim Echad. Elohim is one. God is one. It's the same. It's the Greek equivalent. So ice equals echad. Not plural, not many. It's the exact opposite of plural and unity. It could not be more opposite. Mark 15.34 At the ninth hour Jesus called out with a loud voice saying Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani which being translated is My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? John 3.13 is interesting. Jesus is standing in Jerusalem talking to Nicodemus and he refers to himself as the Son of Man who is in the Heavenly One or who is in the Exalted One because he and the Father are one and we also are in God. Um, but the King Jimmy translators put the final clause there as 
they, the, well, they sort of refer to the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Which, that's rather ugly. Which is in heaven. So they have him standing in Jerusalem and being in heaven all at the same time. This is mysticism. You cannot understand it. And they'll, the lukewarm will shut you down and say, it's a mystery. You've just got to believe it. Well, no, you haven't, because it's fake translating. It's a falsification. John twenty seventeen, Jesus said to the woman, to Mary, Do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Go to my brothers and say to them that I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. Jesus served God just like you do. 1 Peter 1 3 Exalted be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 3.13 God is one. So in the Greek Theos Eis in Hebrew Elohim Echad Romans 15.6 in one voice you might glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. One voice, not a unity, not a plurality, one voice. 1 Corinthians 8, 4, there is no other God but one. For even if there are those known as gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, there is to us, though, one God, the Father, from whom all are all these things as well as ourselves for himself and one Lord Jesus Christ so you see how Paul here distinguishes God from Christ he calls God the Father and he calls Jesus the Lord because Jesus has been uh, given authority over all things by his Father to restore everything and in 1 Corinthians 15, of course, it talks about the day will come when he hands everything back to the Father. Galatians 3.20, but God is one. Ephesians 1.3, exalted be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4.5-6, to 6, uh, sorry, just uh, read verse 6. One God and Father, oh no, sorry, I will read the whole lot. One Lord, one faithfulness, one immersion or baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and among us all. So one Lord and one God and Father of all. Distinguished, Jesus is Lord, but he is not God. God is God. Philippians 2.9 God has highly exalted his Son. So if Jesus were God, how can a God be how can God be exalted? It's nonsense. 1 Timothy 1.17 To the King of Ages, incorruptible, invisible, only wise God, honour and glory throughout the duration of the eons. Ah, oh, that lovely phrase, king of the ages. So, ages, a plural noun. The King James translators altered that plural noun, ages, to an adjective, eternal. They put king eternal. Why? Why did they not want to put king of the ages? Why king eternal? That beautiful phrase, king of the ages, I love it. 1 Timothy 2.5 God is one and there is one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus so Jesus is a high priest he's a mediator he's a man who stands between us and God Titus 2.13 of the great God and of our Saviour Jesus Christ notice the distinction but the others omit the second of and just put of the great God and Saviour. 
So the lukewarm will say to you, well, there is a, there it is a statement that um, Jesus is God, but they omit the of, of the great God and of our Saviour Jesus Christ, both God and Saviour Jesus Christ. All those words are in the genitive, so they take of. James 2.19, you acknowledge that God is one, not a plurality, not a unity. Ice, echad, Elohim echad. Jude 25, to the only wise God, our Saviour, glory and majesty. The only. Revelation 3.2, become watchful and strengthen remaining things that you were about to abandon, for I have found your works fulfilled. I have not found your works fulfilled before my God. That's Jesus speaking. Revelation 3.12, Jesus speaking. Him who comes off victorious, I will make a pillar in the sanctuary of my God. And he will go out no more, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. Revelation 3.14 The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of the creation of God, says these things. So the creation belongs to God, but Jesus has been made a temporary ruler until, as is expressed in 1 Corinthians 15, he hands everything back to his Father, him having restored it, him, Jesus, having restored it. Restored it. Revelation 4.2 I arrived by the agency of a spirit, and a throne was laid down in heaven, and one was seated on the throne. One was seated on the throne. How many? Three? Two? One? One. Hebrews 3.2 speaks of Jesus Christ faithful to him having created him. Him having created. Right, having created is a perfect um, participle verb of the Greek word poio, Strong's Concordance Reference, G4160. It also occurs in the prologue of Hebrews. Him having created him, having created. Poio occurs frequently in Hebrews and elsewhere, create or make. And it never means anything else. But would you believe it? Not all versions have been prepared to translate that properly. Now, in the case of the kingdom, I have footnoted those um, bold versions who have translated it properly. And surprisingly, the Latin Vulgate is one of them. But the King Jimmy and the other lukewarm apostate fizzy pop Bibles have put faithful to him who appointed him. But the verb in Hebrews for appoint is tithimi. And this also is in the prologue right next to poio. So um, the heir of him who appointed him and through whom he designed or created the eons. So we've got tithimi appointed, created or designed, poio, right next to each other. So when it comes to Hebrews 3.2, the translator doesn't need much of a reminder of what poio means, but will already be very familiar with it through the Gospels and other letters. Um, but so they were prepared to change it because when the King James translators got to that verse, they took their doctrine to the Bible. They didn't believe that God created Jesus. So they couldn't possibly mean that because that's not what happened so what are we going to do about this well it can't mean create 
So one of them suggests, um, what about a point? Him, who appointed him? Yes, that's right. Let's put that. They did not translate the word in front of them. It does not mean who appointed. It means having created. It just does. I don't care what anybody says. It just does mean having created. Right, that leaves one other that they call God, and that's the Holy Spirit. Of course, there are many, many other passages I could have brought forward, but, you know, we have to keep a limit. Um, but this Holy Spirit they also call God. Now, there's an article on my website about Holy Spirit capitalized and Holy Spirit without, capitalized, without capitals. Now, when Holy Spirit appears um, decapitalized, like in Ephesians 1.13, the Holy Spirit is the uh, our deposit, and it means the new nature, the Spirit of Christ in us, the new nature, the Spirit of God that inhabits us, indwells us. Um, but there is also an angel titled the Holy Spirit. And in Isaiah 63, verses 9 to 11, the prophet is recounting Moses and the Israelites' um, dealings in their wanderings and how God led them by an angel called His Presence. And you can read this in Exodus 23. And um, that angel s says um, on God's behalf, my name is in him. So that's God saying, my name is in this angel. So Isaiah 63, um, the prophet recalls this angel of his presence who guided them. And he says, verse 9, in all their adversity he was distressed. This is God was distressed. And the angel of his presence saved them, the people. In his love and his pity he redeemed them and he took them up and carried them throughout all the days of old. But they rebelled and they grieved his Holy Spirit. So you see how it's gone from calling the guide um, that was given to them, the angel of his presence, is calling them now his Holy Spirit. So he turned against them to become their enemy. He himself fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses, his people. He said, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who stationed his Holy Spirit among them? So whom did he station among them? The angel of his presence, his chief ambassador angel, who occurs many times under uh, several different titles, but that's another study. But you can find this uh, article on my website, keysofthekingdombible.com. It could not be more plain than here in Isaiah 63, 11, that the angel of his presence is also titled his Holy Spirit. So when Holy Spirit is capitalized, when it should be, and this needs some discernment, and I fully admit it took me a number of years um, to um, decide on some of the passages and, you know, I hope and pray I got them all right, um, but always prepared to retract if I've made an error. That's no problem. Um, but in John 14, when Jesus speaks about the Comforter or the Counselor, who is the Holy Spirit, who Jesus would send. So if this Holy Spirit is God, Jesus is going to send God. Well, no, Jesus is going to send the angel in his place. And indeed, he did appear to the disciples. You can read about it in the book of Acts. So um, this angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, I've noted some passages for you. Exodus fourteen nineteen and 33, 14 to 15. Um, he said, My presence will go and I will give you rest. 
And he said to him, If your so Moses said to God, If your presence will not go, do not make us go up from here. Psalm fifty one eleven Do not drive me from your presence. Your presence, so this is the angel, nor your Holy Spirit take from me. So there's a parallelism. They, the two clauses mean the same. Do not drive from me your presence, clause one, nor your Holy Spirit take from me, clause two. In Hebrew poetry, those parallel um, clauses mean exactly the same. So your presence, right, we know from those Ezekiel passages and Isaiah 63 that this is an angel and nor your Holy Spirit take from me. Holy Spirit capitalized is an angel, not another god in the Babylonian, mystical, occultic, pagan, polytheistic system of mysticism, shutting you down by saying it's a mystery and you can't understand it, you just have to believe it and my husband will explain it when he comes along. So this is another tool of propaganda against the truth revealed. Right, so um, there's a horrible document called the Athanasian Creed. It's ugly writing, really ugly writing, with ugly words and ugly teaching. And it's telling you that if you don't believe in the Trinity, you can't be saved and you'll go to hell. Well, 2 Corinthians 11.4, another Jesus and different gospel. That's what that is. Where did Jesus say, um, you know, believe in the Trinity and you will be saved? All right, nobody has seen God at any time. Exodus 33.20 you cannot see my face, for no one, no man can see me and live. Nobody has seen God at any time. The appearances where it says um, Yahweh appeared to Abraham, this kind of thing, it's always by his angel. So that uh, is sufficient for us to have full confidence that there is no other Elohim beside him. There is no one apart from him. And Elohim is Echad, one, and Ice, one. Paul says to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 34, some are ignorant of the knowledge of God. I speak to your shame. Now, when I came to this understanding, I rejoiced because it made me love and respect my Saviour Jesus even more because if he's not God, well, then he's a man like me and, well, actually, <laughs> that points a finger back at me and saying, Sparks, what's your excuse? Because Jesus overcame every temptation and Hebrews says he was tempted in every point we are. I uh, hesitate at that sometimes, but that's what it says. Uh, later in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he has to warn them about false apostles going round with the purpose of deceiving the people of God. And he says, If he who comes proclaims another Jesus whom we did not proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit which you did not receive from us, or a different gospel, which you did not accept from us, you put up with him as commendable, 2 Corinthians 11.4. And so it is with many. There's three gods as one God and one God as three gods. To many this is commendable. But as Paul says, some are ignorant of the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Luke 16, 31. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, not even if somebody were to rise from among the dead, will they be persuaded. Amen. 
I'm sure you will have many other passages in your minds which um, I could have mentioned and perhaps you might write in the comments section. Right, thank you so much for taking your time to listen to this evidence that God is one, not three. And uh, please click like and subscribe um, if you like these teachings and spread them far and wide. And um, if you do click like, um, the like button, it helps, apparently helps the algorithm quite how that works. I don't know. Well, it's simply that the more popular videos pop up on recommended um, quite a technological miracle how that works but I guess it's all encoded in a kind of stuff I that is beyond me but God bless you all richly and thank you again